In his second letter, John, he is writing to the elect lady and her children. We'll see there in the first verse. This being the church, this being the entire congregation of all of those that are true believers. John tells us that we are to look to ourselves so that we do not lose those things that we have labored, that we have worked for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This encouragement, I believe, would raise a few questions. With the first question being, what are the things that we can lose? All right. All right. The second question, it runs along the very same line with that question being, well, what are we working for? The third question that I believe that is raised from that verse will be this. What is our labor? What is our work? Mm -hmm. Again, I tell you today that we are on the clock. All right. And while we are clocked in, mm -hmm. we have no time to sit down. John's second epistle, it follows up his first epistle by continuing to focus on the subject of true faith. Mm -hmm. As you know, there are two subjects that I commonly teach that I commonly preach about the conduct of the believer right. and then the role that is the duty of the believer. Mm -hmm. You see, I focus on these subjects a great deal because I believe that the believer ought to know how they should carry themselves. And I believe that we ought to know how we should carry ourselves while moving in true faith. That is while laboring in our true faith in the Lord, our God. Now, mm -hmm. someone may ask, well, preacher, what is true faith? Mm -hmm. Faith, many of us would say, is what we believe in our hearts. Now, what the genuine believer believes in their heart is the truth. Well, what is this truth? Well, when I say the truth, I want you to understand that I'm not talking about believing in some fable. I'm not talking about believing in some conspiracy. I'm not talking about believing in some false made up report. No, the truth that I am speaking of today is the truth that we have received from the Lord. Come on, come on. This truth, it was first shared through the prophets of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. This truth was then, it was shared through Jesus Christ. And then it was spoken of, it was taught, it was preached by the apostles yeah. and all the teachers and the preachers that have followed him, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. Faith we have learned, faith we know, is not something that sits still. Faith, it is active. To those of the church, John wrote that we should love one another. And we'll see that he said there in the fifth and in the sixth verse that we should not only love each other, but that we should walk, that we should move according to the commandment of God. Yeah, yeah. I want you to know that those who move according to the commandment of God, they can never go wrong. Mm -hmm. Again, I hope you heard that today. All right. Those who move, those who walk, those who labor according to the commandment of God, they can never go wrong. Right. The reason being is that those who move according to the commandment of God are walking in not their righteousness. They are walking. We as genuine believers, we are walking in God's righteousness. Yeah. And therefore we are laboring in God's truth and not our truth. In his righteousness, we understand that the Lord is always right. Mm -hmm. And by his righteousness, we know that God moves to uplift. Yeah, yeah. God moves to uplift all of those that come to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by God, 
we know that what is good and what is right, we know what is the good way. We know what is the right way mm -hmm. for us to move, for us to labor. Mm -hmm. What is good are all of those things that are done to help uplift, all right. rather than those things that are done to tear down, uh -huh. rather than those things that are done to hurt, rather than those things that are done to bring harm upon someone else. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you hear me here today. So with this in mind, the duty of the believer is not to hinder. The duty of the believer is not to put a stone of stumbling in another's path. The duty of the believer is to edify through love. The duty of the believer is to labor for what is good, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson today. Now, this preaching is not something that is brand new to us, is it? We know that in order for us to be true to our faith in the Lord, our God, we know that we must first humble ourselves. We know that we are to submit ourselves to both the will and to the way of God. In submission to the will and to the way of God, Paul wrote that the elect of God are to put on tender mercies. The elect of God are to put on kindness. The elect of God are to put on humility, meekness, and long suffering. Our hearts, Paul said, should be ruled by the peace of God. In doing the Lord's will, we believers ought to obediently move according to the task that has been given to us by Christ. Mm -hmm. And again, I tell you today that I am not saying something that is brand new to us because I believe that all of us are familiar with the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. And if you have listened to me long enough over this past decade, you know that I have spoken about, that I have taught, that I have preached about the Great Commission a lot. So we should know the Great Commission very well. Yeah, yeah. We know that the will of God is for us to go unto all nations of people and to baptize them in the name of the Father, mm -hmm. in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. True believers have been given the task to teach others to observe all things that Christ has commanded us. Yeah. So I say all of this to you today so that we know what our labor is. Mm -hmm. I say this to you today because our labor, I believe it has been laid out to us. I believe that it is well defined to us by the Lord, our God. All right. The will of God, we know, is for all of us, mm -hmm. all of us that truly believe in him to do good by serving each other but not only serving each other, but also at the same time, serving all of those that are around us. Mm -hmm. all right. Now, the question that we must answer is this. Are we laboring for the Lord today while we are clocked in? Or are we that worker on the job that is sitting down and not doing any work whatsoever. Right. Are we laboring for the Lord today or are we sitting down? Again, I tell you today something that I believe we already know. We are on the clock for the Lord today in the service of spreading his righteousness and in the service of doing good. Now, when I was thinking over this week's sermon, I was thinking about the Sunday school lesson that we had last Sunday. In our lesson last week, we briefly spoke about harvesting as we were looking at the harvest feast of Tabernacle. And I began to, to speak about Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So harvesting was on my mind when I began to prepare this week's sermon. And in a passage of scripture from John's gospel, Jesus, he spoke to the 12 about his labor. 
he spoke to the 12 about the season that we are currently now in. Mm -hmm. and he spoke to them about the labor that we who live today, he spoke about the labor that we have now joined into. And so I want to focus on this labor today. In this passage of scripture from the fourth chapter of John's gospel, we will see Jesus expressed to the disciples when they were busy urging him to eat because he had not ate for some time. If you're looking at the fourth chapter of John's gospel, take a look at that 34th verse. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that Jesus, he said to the disciples while they were going on about him eating, about him filling his belly. Jesus, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. He said again, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Somebody knows that verse. Now, again, the disciples concern there was essentially something that was of the flesh. While Jesus's concern was about the time of season that we are in today. You see, there was a sense of urgency that was coming from Jesus there that the disciples did not quite pick up on. They did not quite understand it. So why the urgency? What was this work of the father that Jesus said he had to finish, that Jesus said he had to do? As we looked at the fourth chapter of John's gospel, as Jesus was preparing to make his next statement to the 12, he looked out at a field. And I picture that as Jesus looked out at, a, at this field, at a smile, I believe it began to come across his face. And we'll see that Jesus said to them there in the 35th verse, he said, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? All right. All right. There in that 35th verse, we'll see that Jesus, he told his disciples to lift up their eyes and to look out at the fields. Yes, yes. And he told them that the fields were already white. Mm -hmm. They were already ready for harvest. You know, what did Jesus, what did he mean by this? Come on, come on. Now, Jesus, we, we must understand here today, he was speaking spiritually at that moment. You see, it was not literally time to physically go out and harvest the fields. As Jesus said, there were still four months until harvest would come. So what was it? What was Jesus? What did he mean when he said that the fields were white, that they were ready for harvest here? All right, all right. Spiritually speaking, there was a field, I tell you today, whose crop was ready to harvest, mm -hmm. whose crop, I tell you today, is still ready to harvest. Mm -hmm. The field that Jesus was speaking of in this verse, it relates to the world. And the crop that Jesus was speaking of that is in that field relates to all the people that is in the world today. Yeah, yeah. The work that Jesus was to do, the work that Jesus was finishing up, we should understand was harvesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, it was a work that began through his father when his father called out to Abraham when his father called out to Isaac, mm -hmm. when his father called out to Jacob. Mm -hmm. So we should understand that we today, we are in a season of harvesting. All right. All right. See, I tell you today that there is an urgent need to labor in this field. Mm -hmm. There is an urgent need to work 
There is an urgent need to move for the Lord. I know this because Christ has tasked us with this great commission. And if it was urgent to Christ, then you better believe that if you are a child of God, if you are a true believer, this labor, this work, it is urgent for you today. There is no time for the believer to sit down while they are clocked in, while they are on this job for God. Do you hear me here today? Yes. Yes, yes. Come on. Now, to further show you the work of Christ Mm -hmm. so that we can know, so that we can understand our labor. I now want you to turn over to the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel. Mm -hmm. And I want you to look at the 24th through the 30th verse. There's a parable here that I want to share with you that we have actually gone over before in the Sunday school lesson a long time ago. But there is a parable here that speaks to the labor that Christ was in and the labor that we are now in today. This parable is the parable of the wheat and tares. Mm -hmm. Jesus, when he began this parable there in the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel and in the 24th verse, we'll see that Jesus He began this parable by saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, the field that this man owned. Yet while that man slept, we are told there in the 25th verse, another man came along the way. And this other man was the enemy of the owner of the field, we are told there. And his enemy came to his field and sowed seed in his field is what we're told there. Now the man that had sown good seed, we can liken to somebody. Mm -hmm. We can liken this man to the Lord, our God. God again reached out to man. God again cleansed the earth. And then after cleansing the earth, God, he reached out to man again, and he did so over and over and over again over the course of time to this day. The Lord is still reaching out. God is still calling out to man. Mm -hmm. Though I do want to point out here to you today that the Lord, unlike the man in this parable, the Lord, he did not go to sleep. (laughs) God is not asleep today. God never sleeps. And God has not stepped away as some would like to believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The enemy in this parable, therefore, we would liken to Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The enemy, therefore, would be Satan who slithered and sowed his seeds of wickedness. And he did so right there in the garden. It didn't take Satan alone to sow his seeds of wickedness. Mm -hmm. So to be clear here, God, the father has sown good seed in, in his instructions. Mm -hmm. He sowed good seed in his truth. Mm -hmm. And then Satan in the same field, that is this world, Satan sowed his seed of the great lie, the great deception. Mm -hmm. When Jesus spoke of his labor to the Jews, he always expressed to them that he had come to do the father's will. Mm -hmm. Jesus said that he had not come to destroy men's lives, Mm -hmm. but that he had come to save them. Mm -hmm. If we were to speak figuratively again here for just a second, Mm -hmm. we would say that Jesus, he did not come to tear down the field. He did not come to burn down the field. In other words, Jesus, he did not come to destroy the crop that was growing in the field. You see, Jesus, he came to ensure the growth of the crop. Jesus, he came to gather in what he could gather. On another occasion in scripture, we will see that Jesus said that the son of man had come to seek and to save that which was lost. Again, 
And Jesus, he came to harvest. All right. All right. Yet within his labor, within his labor of harvesting, we find that Jesus had to also do some sowing as well. Jesus had to also do some sowing of the truth when he came and when he taught, when he preached, when he healed. In sowing the truth, Jesus, he called out the sins of man, but he also showed a pathway of mercy. He showed a pathway of forgiveness. Jesus, he sowed seeds to show man a pathway to righteousness. Some may wonder, well, why did Jesus have to sow these seeds? Why did Jesus have to come to the world? Why did he have to teach? Why did he have to preach this truth to man when God from the beginning was already sowing those same seeds? Well, again, according to the parable of the field that the Lord has sown his seed in, it grew to be infested by tares. And tares, they are an invasive weed that looks very similar to the wheat yes, sir. Yes, that was sown in the field by that certain man, by the Lord. Mm-hmm. The tares, those weeds, they grew from the lies. They grew from the ignorant conspiracies. Mm-hmm. They grew from the deceptions that were sown by Satan. Come on, come on. So the field of the owner was covered by a good crop of wheat. Mm -hmm. But at the very same time, we find that this field was also covered in tares. Mm -hmm. This field was covered in weeds as well. Mm -hmm. So what was Jesus supposed to do about it? He sold more. Mm -hmm. He sold more truth in the field. Mm -hmm. Now, what this means for all of us today is that Our world is a world that is filled with wheat and tares. Both the good seed and the bad seed have sprouted up together in this field that is our world. Mm -hmm. The good in the world, they have grown from the truth that has been sown by the Father, that has been sown by the Son, that has been sown by the Holy Spirit. The bad in the world have sprouted up from the seed of the great lie that has been sown by Satan. And those who have been sprouted up from that seed, they believe in the seed that has been sown by Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't figured it out quite yet, we live in a mess of a world. And I tell you today that Christ, he didn't even attempt to try and hide the kind of world that he walked in and that we live in today. (laughs) Scripture does not hide it. Scripture tells us that the world is a mess. That's the point of God's message. Mm -hmm. That's why he sowed the seeds of truth Mm -hmm. to let us know that we are living in a messy world. So this is why Christ moved with such urgency while he walked in this world Mm -hmm. to prevent the spreading of more weeds in this field. Now, if we look further at this parable, we'll see that the servants, uh, the owner of the field, mm-hmm. they're in the 28th verse. Yeah, yeah. We are told that they came to him and that they asked him, do you want us to go and gather them the tares? All right. Do you want us to take them up? All Essentially right. is what they said there in that verse. Mm-hmm. And the owner responded with a no. And that the wheat and the tares that they should grow together until the final harvest. You won't see final there, but we know that in this parable, Jesus was speaking of the final harvest here. And he said that at that time of that final harvest, the reapers will gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn the wheat will be gathered and stored in the owner's barn is what we're told there in the 29th and in the 30th verse. Mm -hmm. So this is the reason why Jesus labored with the urgency that he did. The final harvest is drawing near. Mm -hmm. 
It was drawing near back then, and, and we've lived a whole lot of years later, right? So we know that if it was close then, it is closer now today. The final harvest is coming. It is drawing near. That is why Jesus moved with urgency. How do you suppose that you should labor in that field today? Again, I tell you today, there is no time for the believer to sit down while we are clocked in. We know the task that we have been given. We know the duty. We know the job now. We know that we should now be moving with some urgency. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In John's gospel here, Jesus, he said to the 12, they're in the fourth chapter. And in the 37th and in the 38th verse, Jesus said, one sows and another reaps. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand your duty, you will understand it now as a believer. Jesus says, one sows and another reaps. He said to the 12, I have sent you to reap. Jesus has spoken about his labor and now he is focusing in on our labor as his disciples. No, we aren't part of the 12. We weren't of the 12, but we are his followers today. We truly follow after him. We are genuine believers. We are disciples of Christ. Our labor is like that of one sowing in the field. Mm -hmm. Our labor is like that of one reaping in the field. Yeah, yeah. And I would ask you today, are you sowing with urgency? Mm -hmm. And then again, I would ask you today, are you gathering in? Are you reaping today? Now, I cannot pretend to have ever worked in a field a day of my life. So it would be hard for me to speak about working in the field. It would be hard for me to speak about farm life from my own personal experience. So I won't even bother to try to do it. That being said, my dad, who did spend days working in the field as he grew up, uh, he did not share many fun memories about picking peaches in the peach orchards or having to pick cotton in a cotton field. From his personal experience, what he taught me, what he told me about working in the fields is that laboring in the fields is not easy. It's not easy work. It is hard work. When you think about farmers, they have to, they have, to have a, a great deal of hard work ethic. Yeah, yeah. They have to have a, a great amount of understanding as well. They have to understand the time and they have to understand the season. Mm -hmm. They have to know when to plant. They have to know when to harvest. Mm -hmm. And then in their work life, they work from sunrise to sunset. Mm -hmm. And maybe even earlier or maybe even later than that. Farmers, they have to tend to their animals. They have to tend to their flock, if you will. They have to tend to their fields. They have to tend to their crops. You see, for the farmer, there's very little time for them to sit down. So someone may ask, well, why all of this hard work? Why are farmers out there working so hard? Well, farmers, they, they have to eat, don't they? And farmers, they certainly... They have a goal of being able to make a living as well. And in their making a living, we reap their benefits. We get to eat as well. Farmers, they are putting forth their best efforts so that they can be rewarded with a good crop. And a good crop equals a good harvest. This is the fruit of all of their, their labor and we reap from the fruit of their labor. A lazy farmer will reap a poor crop. They will reap a poor harvest, which in the end, it does no good for anybody. Mm -hmm. They go hungry, we would go hungry. All of us would seem to have very little reward in the lazy farmer's labor. So the work of a farmer, it is indeed difficult work. We have a labor that is very similar. Mm -hmm. 
a labor where our hard work, others may reap a reward from our hard labor. Where we have lived and where we have reaped a reward from their labor. Though my labor is not literally in the field, today I would testify to you as a minister that laboring for the Lord can be rather difficult. Yet as Paul said to the Galatians, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Mm -hmm. For he who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Mm -hmm. So I would again ask you today, are you laboring for the Lord today? Are you laboring so that those around you can reap the benefits of your labor in the same manner in which you reap the benefits of those that came before you, their labor? Yes, yes, yes. What is your labor in the world today? What are you doing? What kind of work are you doing today is what I'll ask you. What kind of work are you putting into this world today? Again, Jesus said that one sows and that one reaps. You are in a sea, you and I are in a season that draws near to the final harvest. We are among the field of wheat. We are among the field of tares. And I tell you today that there is no time for us to sit down as the tares continue to spread throughout the field that we are now in. The tares, the weeds are spreading throughout this field with its lies, with its deceptions, with its ignorant conspiracies, and with all of its false reports. Do you now understand the urgency for which you and I, we are to labor with in this field? That we are to labor with on behalf of the Lord and then again, on behalf of all of those that are around us, mm -hmm. do you understand that there is no time for you to sit down today in this field that is our world when it comes to us laboring for righteousness? To the Colossians, Paul shared a word of encouragement, which I want to share with you today. This word of encouragement is said, whatever you do, Whatever you do in labor, do it heartily, mm -hmm. do it wholeheartedly as to the labor that is for the Lord and not to men. We are to not labor half heartedly for the Lord. All right. All right. We are to label labor wholeheartedly for the Lord, our God. And we are to labor in his instructions. We are to labor in his truth today. Again, I tell you that we are on the clock today as the weeds continue to rapidly spread through the field with all of their lies, with all of their deceptions, with all of their conspiracies and with all of their false reports. And those weeds, they spread with a smile on their face. I tell you today that as those who vigorously sow such seeds of wickedness, as they sow those seeds vigorously, I tell you today that we, the believer, we who are of the good seed, we should sow seeds of righteousness just as they do, if not more vigorously than they do. That is how we are to labor in this field. We are to labor with some kind of vigorous with some kind of urgency. Right. And I say today that we are on the clock. Jesus again said to the disciples, one sows and another reaps. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he again said to the disciples, I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Mm -hmm. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. You and I, as true believers, we have entered into the great labor that has been laid on us by the Lord our God. We have entered into the great labor of fighting the good fight of faith. 
we have entered into the great labor that those who came before us have already labored in. The baton, I tell you today, it has been passed on to us. And we must continue in that labor. We must not drop the baton. All of last month I preached to the complaint that many have about this world, with it being an unfair world. Yes, it is an unfair world, but we have seen that we can do something about this world being an unfair world. It is said that the world is doing nothing but getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. All of us in this room, we have probably thought it, and we have probably even said that ourselves. This place is doing nothing but getting worse and worse. This again, it is true, as we have seen here through this parable. The tares in the field, they are growing and they are spreading. They are sprouting up. If we turn back to 2 John, we will see that John spoke to this, that John said, many deceivers have gone into the world and, and those deceivers, he said there in the seventh verse of second John, they are spoken against Christ. John, not hiding it, said that the deceivers that speak against Christ, those that would dare say a word against Christ in the flesh, those that would speak a word against his benevolence, his righteousness, just said that they are an antichrist, that they are a form of the antichrist. They are anti-truth, in other words. In other words, they are anti-good. In other words, they are anti-righteousness. John, he lived in a season of false reports. And again, I tell you today that if you look around at this world that we live in today, you will realize right away that all of us, we are living in a season of false reports. You and I, we are living in a season of anti-truth. We are living in a season of anti-good. Mm -hmm. We are living in a season of anti-righteousness. Mm -hmm. And again, I would ask, what are you as the child of God? What are you doing about it? Well. Are you joining in with the false report? As we said in our Sunday school lesson hold today. On, on. Are, are you joining in with the anti-truth? Mm -hmm. Are you joining in today with the anti-good? Are you joining in today with the anti-righteousness? What are you as a child of God? What are you as a disciple of Christ? What are you doing today? Well. I would say to you today that though the world is getting worse and worse, as we like to say, mm -hmm. we must remember from that parable that the wheat that was sown in the field by God it has also grew up. It has also sprouted up in this world. And I tell you today that it is still sprouting up in the world today. If you have sprouted up from God's righteousness, from his truth, rather than complaining about the world getting worse and worse, be the part of the world that is actually growing to be better and better. Be a part of the world that is trying to make a change for this world to be a better place is what I encourage you today. Don't stand with those who will care about a false report. Stand with all of those who will share, who will spread the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 See, those who sow seed of good will reap the benefits of those seeds that have been sown. Mm -hmm. Those who sow should be sowing good and those who reap should be working together to gather in, mm -hmm. to gather up, mm -hmm. to bring in the good to the congregation 
of all those that truly believe in Christ. Yes, the work, it is a difficult work. But as Paul said, let us put our soul into this great labor that has been laid onto us by the Lord our God. Many of us, we will grind and we will hustle in our worldly labors so that we can be in line for a great reward. Whether it is a pay raise or whether it is a bonus or a promotion or etc., whatever it may be. If we can put our whole heart into our worldly works for a worldly treasure, surely, surely I say today that we could put our whole heart into the good work of the Lord, our God. Surely we could put our whole heart in our laboring for the Lord. Surely I believe that we can do this one thing. Again, in his letter to the Galatians, Paul wrote that we should not grow weary in doing good and that in every opportunity we have to do good, we should do what is right. We should do what is good. You and I should not grow weary in laboring according to the commandment of God. We should not grow weary in doing good, which we again know is to help in uplifting all of those that are around us. We know that to do good is to sow the seeds of God's truth. We know that doing good is to sow seeds of God's righteousness, to sow seeds of God's instructions. We know that if we were to sow these seeds, that more wheat would be growing up in this field instead of tares. And I tell you today that we have so many avenues to where we can reach out in this truth. We can do it face to face. We can do it now through radio and through TV. And we can do it. If you're like me, you can do it through social media, through the use of the Internet as well. We have no excuse today to be sitting down while we are clocked in. Every last believer has a means to be able to do the good work, to fight the good fight of faith, to sow seeds of good in the world that we live in today. Again, John encouraged us to look to ourselves so that we do not lose those things that we have worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. You and I today, we have worked for the good of God so that it is not overcome by the weeds of the field. We don't want to lose the souls that are around us. We can't lose salvation when we genuinely believe in the Lord, but we can lose souls, the souls of those around us, if we are not letting his salvation be known to man. I say to you today that we should move with urgency in this season that we are now living in. So let us join in and let us continue to fight the good fight of faith. And let us do so with all sense of urgency. So that one day we can hear the Lord say to us, Well done, thou good and thou faithful servant. We are on the clock today. Let us stop sitting down while we are on the clock today. Amen. 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 Amen.